Um, so our first speaker today and our, is going to be Niha Narula from the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. Um, and she's going to be talking about uh, ZK Ledger. Neha? Thanks, Chinda. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for showing up this early. I know it's pretty hard after um, all the fun last night. Um, so, uh, as Chinda said, I lead a group here at MIT called the Digital Currency Initiative. We're part of the MIT Media Lab. Um, and uh, the director of the Media Lab, Joey, who spoke yesterday in the morning, is the person who, um, one of the people who founded this group. And we focus on cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology research uh, from the Media Lab. And we work with people at CSAIL and Sloan as well. And um, so I'm here to talk to you this morning about a project that uh, we did. Um, this was myself and my co-authors, Willie Vasquez, who's currently at UT Austin, but was an MN here when he did his work, and Madars Virza, who did his PhD here and is now also working at the MIT Media Lab and with the DCI. And we call this project ZK Ledger, um, or how I learned to stop worrying and achieve privacy and auditing on blockchains. Okay. <clears throat> so I think a major thing that we're all concerned about right now is financial regulation. Everyone is looking at what the SEC is saying, what the CFTC is saying. Um, we're all sort of wondering what's going to happen with ICOs. A lot of the exchanges in the space are engaging in some slightly worrisome activities. Um, and I think it's important to remember that financial regulation is there for a reason. Financial regulation is there to help provide financial stability for our economy. It's there for investor protection to make sure that people don't get taken advantage of. It's also there to support market integrity. We can't have an efficient, fair market without market integrity. People need to believe that assets are really there when people say that they're there, um, that things are happening fairly. So financial regulation is quite important uh, in our economy. And we use auditing to achieve these policy goals. Auditing as the way it happens right now, is the full examination of the books of an organization. And it's intended to show that institutions are, in fact, complying with financial regulation. Now, there have been some interesting things that have happened so far where um, we didn't really maintain financial stability and where auditing failed. Of course, there's the classic example of Lehman Brothers during, during the 2008 financial crisis, um, which in fact quite possibly spurred the whole existence of Bitcoin and blockchains. <clears throat> and so I want to show you this, um, this, uh, this quote here, which says, Auditors were either culpably unaware of the mounting dangers at banks, or they were at fault for not sharing any concerns with supervisors. Either way, auditor complacency had been a significant contributory factor in the banking meltdown. And this is from the, uh, the Financial Times. So, <clears throat> I think what this quote shows is that auditing often fails us. Now, traditional auditing, the way that it works right now, is done by what's known as the big four. There are four massive auditing organizations that audit 80% of all US companies and 99% of the companies in the FTSE 100. So 99 out of those 100 companies are audited by the same four. Um, here are the four. EY, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG. And here are some of the institutions that they were in charge of auditing. Um, we know what happened there. Uh, I particularly like the example of what happened with Bernie Madoff. There's a story about how, um, you know, the auditor was coming by and they literally just delayed the auditor in a room while they went and printed out a new version of a ledger that showed transaction, like showed fictitious transactions. And, and you know, they were, they were, they put it in the refrigerator to cool it down from the printer before they showed it to the auditor. So this is a great story. And of course, of course, um, last year's Oscars had the infamous flub where uh, they, uh, they gave the wrong envelope to the announcer. So even though there were people there who were supposed to be making sure that the right best movie was announced, um, you know, they show that picture of them with the suitcase and they're watching the, the um, the, the, the envelopes that say who won what award, um, there was a major flub at the Oscars last year. 
So <clears throat> there are a lot of problems with traditional auditing as it works right now. Auditors can miss things or collude, and I just gave you several examples of how that might happen. Arthur Anderson used to be one of the big major auditing firms, but then Enron happened. They failed to catch $100 billion worth of fraud. Auditing is also an arduous, time-consuming process. It's nowhere near real time. It involves many, many people and a ton of manual labor. And of course, auditing requires a company to completely open its books. They have to open up their books and share everything that they're doing with the auditor. And this really influences what ends up getting audited and what doesn't end up getting audited. So the question that we wanted to answer was, how can we create a practical system for auditing with privacy? Now, blockchains, of course, are changing the way that finance works. We have this new distributed ledger paradigm where instead of settling assets through trusted third parties, participants can all work together to maintain a distributed ledger, and ownership on the ledger is actually asset ownership. So whenever ownership changes on this ledger, a transaction is settled, and it means that a digital asset has actually moved from one party to another. This paradigm has a lot of benefits. So first of all, participants can all together validate and verify correctness so they can make sure that the right thing is happening. Also, as I said, a transaction is settlement, and this reduces the costs of reconciliation between multiple different databases. So when we go back and we look at those problems that we had with traditional auditing, auditors can miss things or collude, and it's an arduous, time-consuming process, we see that blockchains or distributed ledgers actually can help with some of these problems. Using participant verification, we can try to make sure that everyone is looking at what's going on and verifying that the right thing is happening. And using the real-time settlement nature of blockchains, we can audit and verify in roughly real time instead of on a delay of months. However, we still have this problem with privacy. And in fact, this privacy problem has actually been made worse because with most blockchains, all transactions are public to all participants in the ledger. So with public permissionless blockchains like Bitcoin, everything is public. With permissioned ledgers, the transactions are still public to the participants in the ledger. So I'd like to introduce a project that we've been working on here at the DCI that we call ZK Ledger. The goal of ZK Ledger is to enable auditing and practical privacy on blockchains and distributed ledgers. Our goals include the integrity and verification of transactions, but we also want to be able to audit these transactions privately without revealing what's actually inside of them and we want to be able to do so using well-understood cryptographic primitives. We use a number of techniques to achieve this. Right now, ZK Ledger is for permission blockchains. We use public key encryption, and we also use non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs. Our first application that we've considered is to banks and managing systemic risk in the financial system, but we think that these techniques will affect and could apply to other applications as well. But for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to talk about this one type of application and use case. So what we see here is that ZK Ledger really helps sort of fix some of the problems with traditional auditing. Um, blockchains help with participant verification and performance. And with the techniques that we use in ZK Ledger, we also get strong privacy along with complete auditing. Now, there are other techniques for privacy in blockchains. So Bitcoin actually gives some degree of privacy in the sense that you can use pseudonymous public keys. You don't actually have to reveal your identity. <clears throat> other permission blockchain systems like Corda use the idea of trusted notaries. So instead of revealing a transaction to all of the participants in the permission ledger, you use a trusted notary to validate the transaction. There are techniques using trusted hardware, like Intel SGX. There are coin mixers. Um, there's also uh, 
a technique used in confidential transactions and confidential assets, which is being used by Blockstream and Chain. Um, and, and these techniques use Peterson commitments and range proofs to achieve privacy in the amounts and assets being transferred. There's ring signatures used in Monero and CryptoNote, and of course, there's ZK snarks, which are used in ZeroCash and Zcash. In ZK Ledger, we actually focus just on range proofs and Peterson commitments. Um, and part of that is because of the trusted setups requirement for ZK snarks. And I just want to point out that none of these systems actually provide auditing. These are techniques that they just use to achieve transaction privacy. <clears throat> so existing privacy-preserving blockchains don't offer private auditing. They offer regulators little to no insight. And I'm talking about confidential assets and Zcash right now. Zcash has a technique called selective transparency where they can open up certain things for a regulator or for an auditor, but it doesn't really support rich measurements of what's going on in the ecosystem. And, and I argue that this is just not tenable for the real world. Financial stability is actually quite important and ensuring that your counterparty has the assets that they say they do and measuring systemic risk in the financial system is critical for our economy. Now, one way to audit on these private blockchain systems is to simply ask someone to open up all of their transactions and then actually look at them and measure the assets that they have. The problem with this is that you can't actually ever be sure that a person has given you all of their relevant transactions. That technique suffers from a lack of completeness. There's no way that I can prove that I've actually unveiled all of the relevant transactions that you might be interested in. So I've created this nice chart here to kind of talk about some of the properties that we're trying to achieve. So we want to achieve complete auditing, right? And like I said, with confidential assets and Zcash, you, the auditor can never really be sure that someone has opened up all of the relevant transactions. Using trusted notaries, since the trusted notaries can see everything, they can be sure that they've seen um, the relevant transactions. So there's also participant verification and strong privacy. Um, the problem with trusted notaries is that now you're trusting a single entity to validate transactions instead of letting all of the participants in the ledger validate transactions. And confidential assets, confidential transactions provide some degree of privacy, but it doesn't actually hide what's known as the transaction graph. And the transaction graph actually reveals a lot of information. Because these systems use unspent transaction outputs as their model, transactions need to point to previous transactions where someone received assets in order to spend them. And this, uh, the FBI has used this to track people from Silk Road. This actually reveals quite a bit of information. So ZK Ledger achieves all three of these properties, and I've also included an ideal column here to talk about what we would want our ideal system to do. We would want it to have complete auditing, participant verification, and strong privacy. But we also want it to be efficient. It shouldn't take minutes or hours to create a transaction. Um, and the problem with a lot of cryptography used today is that it can be quite slow. So we need to choose the right cryptographic primitives to make sure that transaction creation is efficient. We would also like to avoid trusted setup. So systems that use ZK snarks rely on what is known as trusted setup. Participants, um, someone needs to create some information and then they need to remove that information and no longer, no longer have it. And if they don't, they can undetectably create assets in the system. There are ways to get around this problem of trust. For example, Zcash held a trusted ceremony, a special ceremony to a multi-party computation to try to compute this data. Um, that helps a lot because now you just need to make sure that at least one participant was honest instead of all of them. Um, and Zcash is actually working on an even bigger trusted ceremony right now, Powers of Tau. But these things are very difficult to do and very difficult to get right. It's really, really hard to actually ensure that your ceremony went well and 
the downsides of your ceremony not going well are catastrophic. An attacker can undetectably create assets in the system. So it would be really great to avoid trusted setup. Now, there are techniques coming down the pipeline to, uh, to, to, to enable zero-knowledge proofs, general zero-knowledge proofs, without trusted setup. And hopefully in the future, ZK Ledger could take advantage of them as well. Now, <clears throat> there is one feature that we would really like that ZK Ledger does not provide, and that is scalability in the number of participants being audited. Right now, ZK Ledger can only handle a relatively small number of banks on the order of tens of banks instead of hundreds of thousands or millions. So the techniques in ZK Ledger as they exist right now don't apply to permissionless systems like Bitcoin or Ethereum. So this is the overview for the rest of the talk. I'll discuss our contributions, describe the system model for ZK Ledger, um, show how exactly we construct our transactions to achieve these things, um, give you a little bit about the implementation, and show you an evaluation to prove that it's relatively reasonable performance. So our contributions are the design of ZK Ledger, which provides privacy, strong transaction privacy. You can't tell who's involved in transactions or how much they're transacting. and complete auditing. This only relies on well-established components, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, and spe specifically generalized SNORP proofs and range proofs. And we also came up with an interesting MapReduce model for auditing, which I don't think I'll have a lot of time to go into, but you can see our paper for more details. We also have an implementation and an evaluation which shows reasonable performance. So, here is a very high-level overview of what a ZK Ledger system might look like. So here we have four banks, each with a copy of a ledger. So there is a ledger that all of these four banks are constructing together. There's also an auditor, not shown here yet. Transactions are encrypted commitments to asset transfers that are stored on this ledger. And importantly, these commitments can be homomorphically combined across transactions in interesting ways. We're assuming that we're running on a permission blockchain, but the actual way the ledger works and the specific consensus protocol is not really relevant to ZK Ledger. ZK Ledger could work on many different types of permission blockchains, or even a centralized database. So the ledger could be maintained by a single machine or it could be maintained by all of the banks working together in a consensus protocol. And there's an auditor. Now, the auditor could be one of the banks. The auditor queries the banks to get answers to its questions. For example, how much of this asset do you have on your balance sheet? What is the concentration of this asset across different banks? The auditor communicates with the banks, gets an answer, and then confirms that that answer is correct by referring back to the commitments on the ledger. So note that cooperation is required here, but the auditor can always detect if a bank is lying about the answer. <clears throat> So this slide summarizes our security goals. We want to make sure that banks cannot violate transactional integrity. So because the ledger contains these commitments that just look like opaque data to the outside world, we have to construct these transactions very carefully to make sure that they're actually valid transactions and that they're preserving certain invariants about the financial system. We also want to ensure that banks cannot lie to the auditor or omit transactions. So we want to provide complete auditing. A bank shouldn't be able to hide some of the transactions that, from the auditor. We also want to ensure banks can make progress. So it shouldn't be that we don't trust the banks in this scenario, and it shouldn't be the case that a malicious bank, by not cooperating, can hold up the entire system. And of course, we want to make sure that the auditor and any banks that are not party to the specific transaction cannot see transaction participants, amounts, or the transaction graph. 
Now, what is currently public in ZK Ledger are issuance, so if more of an asset is issued, we assume that that's done publicly. Withdrawal from the system, so if assets are removed from the system, we also assume that's done publicly. The timing of transactions, that's also public. And right now, the asset types are public. And it's future work to try to hide the actual type of the asset being transacted. <clears throat> so let me show you what a transaction in ZK Ledger actually looks like. So the basic idea here is that transactions are Peterson commitments. Every transaction, you can think of the ledger as a table, and every row in the table is a transaction, while columns in the table, while the columns in the table represent the different banks. So there's a column for every single bank in the system. And this is part of why we don't scale very well. The system is account-based. We don't use UTXOs. However, like confidential transactions and confidential assets, we use Peterson commitments. So when a bank wants to create a transaction which transfers assets to another bank, and what we see here is bank one is transferring $100 to bank two, Bank one will create a transaction with an entry for every bank in the system with Peterson commitments committing to the value that is, going, that is being decremented from its account and added to another account. This is what the Peterson commitment actually looks like. We use an elliptic curve group and the bank that's creating the transaction will create a commitment of this form. It'll choose some randomness. In fact, it has to choose n pieces of randomness um, for each bank, and then it'll produce these Peterson commitments. Now note that for the uninvolved banks, the values in the Peterson commitment are all zero. So the only places where there's an actual non-zero value are for the banks transacting. However, this is perfectly hiding. No one looking at the ledger can actually tell where the values are zero or non-zero. Now, given this basic primitive with the Peterson commitments, let me show you how we can audit, do a very simple type of audit inquiry. <clears throat> so this is a toy example. So assume that we have a ledger with the commitments that I just showed you before, Peterson commitments. And we would like to compute an aggregate. We would like to know how much of an asset a bank has on its balance sheet. So right now, let's assume there's a single asset. So all of the rows here correspond to the asset that we're interested in. And we're auditing bank I right now. So the two participants in this auditing protocol are bank I and the auditor. Note something else interesting here, none of the other banks need to be online for the auditor to audit bank I, which is nice. So the auditor will send a query to bank I. Bank I will then respond to the auditor with both the answer to the query, and if this query is how much of this asset do you have on your balance sheet, then the answer is the sum of all the values in the bank's column and also an extra piece of information, which is the sum of all the randomnesses in the, in the column for that bank. Now with these two pieces of information, the auditor can then go back and look at the encrypted ledger, grab all of the commitments in that bank's column, sum them together, and then actually confirm that the sum of the values plus the sum of the randomnesses equals the sum of the commitments. Given the way that Peterson commitments work, it would be very difficult for a bank to produce a value that does not correspond to what's actually on the ledger. So the auditor has high confidence that this is in fact the amount of this asset that the bank has on its balance sheet. This is the basic idea of how auditing works. However, there are still multiple challenges to solve. 
First of all, how do we prove that these transactions are actually valid? That the bank had assets to transfer, that they're not creating assets out of nowhere? We still have to be able to publicly verify this log. In addition, the example I sh in the example I showed you, Bank I needs to know all of the randomnesses in its column. But how does it know the randomnesses in the transactions in which it wasn't involved? We don't want to have to rely on the other banks to tell it, because they might lie. <coughs> so there are still multiple issues to solve. We need to make sure transactions are valid, and that means preserving certain invariants. We want to make sure no funds are created or destroyed. And in order to do that, we use a proof of balance. We want to make sure that a bank actually has assets to spend. To do that, we use a proof of assets. And that that bank has the right to spend the assets that it's talking about. So one bank shouldn't be able to spend another bank's assets. And to do that, we use a proof of knowledge of secret key. Because we're using elliptic curve groups and the Peterson commitments, we need to make sure that the values don't wrap around the modulo of the group. So we need a range proof, as in for the same reason that confidential transactions and confidential assets needs a range proof. We also want to make sure that a bank can always respond to the auditor. So it shouldn't be the case that a malicious bank can screw up one bank's entry and make it so that they can't talk to the auditor. And for that, we use what we call an audit token, which is not an ICO token. Think of it more like a, a key or a chip or something like that. It's a tool. Um, and we use proofs of consistency. So if we go back to our example here, where bank one is transferring $100 to bank two, we can start to fill in the pieces that we need in this transaction. The Peterson commitments alone are not enough. So first of all, we need proof of balance. We want to make sure that in this transaction, assets were neither created nor destroyed. Doing this is actually the simplest proof. We want to make sure that the sum of all the values in the row sums to zero. That means no assets were created or destroyed. And we actually do that by picking the randomnesses cleverly. So we make sure that the randomnesses also sum to zero. And thus, if you sum up all the commitments in the row, it should sum to the identity. So there's one of those proofs per transaction, uh, a proof that assets weren't created or destroyed, that all of the values sum to zero. Now we want to make sure that the bank actually has the assets that it is claiming to have to transfer. Now the way that we do that is we add an extra commitment that commits to the sum of the values in the bank's column. Now this should be greater than zero, including this transaction, if the bank actually has assets to transfer. If a bank is not, but remember, we don't want to reveal which banks are involved in which transactions, so we also need to include sort of a dummy form of this commitment if it's not the spending bank. And we include proof of knowledge of secret key for the spending bank. So this is a disjunctive proof. It's a bit complicated. It's basically saying either I'm the spending bank and I'm proving I have the assets to transfer, or I'm not a spending bank and I'm committing to zero, and I don't necessarily know anything. But we need to be able to not distinguish between these two cases. So we have these additional commitments that are part of the ledger. And then we need the range proofs. So the range proofs in confidential transactions and confidential assets use a primitive called Borromean ring signatures. These are actually the largest part of the proofs in ZK Ledger. They are the slowest to create, the slowest to verify, and the biggest. But what's very exciting is that while we were doing this work, bullet proofs came out. And bullet proofs are a slightly faster, smaller way of creating these range proofs. So we are just in the beginning of implementing bullet proofs for our system, but I'm optimistic that it'll actually really help our performance. So then the next thing we add is the range proof. And <coughs> the point, it's very important to note here that the bank that's spending can create this transaction without 
involving any other banks. This is kind of the way most blockchains work. You can create a payment without having to go get a signature from somebody else. And this is important because it means that the other banks can't block a bank from producing a transaction. It also means that the other banks don't have an opportunity to validate the transaction before it goes on the ledger. So we need a way that all banks can validate publicly that the transaction is correct, that it has the appropriate proofs, that it was constructed the right way. And we do that using the audit token and the proof of consistency. So there are additional pieces to the transaction for every bank where there's a special token that that bank can use to respond to the auditor. And there are some proofs that show that everything in these proofs match up correctly and are what they're supposed to be and that the audit token was, is well formed. So there's a lot more detail here and I'm going to point you to our paper at the end of the talk. I'll have a link if you'd like to learn more about exactly what the proofs look like and how the system works. But I wanna make sure that I talk a little bit about the types of auditing that we support. So systemic risk is actually incredibly important. The world is becoming more and more interconnected. The economy in one country can greatly affect the economy in another country. One important type of risk to assess is counterparty risk. You wanna be able to tell whether or not the person you're transacting with really has the assets that they say they do, or you might wanna be able to tell whether or not they have some other set of assets that you might consider to be toxic, and so they might suffer um, should something change. So it'd be really great if your counterparty could prove to you that it holds certain assets. Another thing that a lot of regulators often want to determine is the concentration of asset holdings in a system. So in my toy example, I showed how to audit one bank, but an, uh, an auditor can actually audit many banks together and combine their answers to determine interesting things. For example, how concentrated is this asset? Is it held amongst a few banks or many different banks? How has that changed over time? So the auditing that ZK Ledger supports goes beyond aggregates. We can do ratios, for example, what percentage of my is my exposure to asset X out of my total holdings. We can do approximations, so you can actually fuzz the answers instead of providing an exact answer, provably fuzz the answers. For example, what is the order of magnitude of my trades without revealing the precise number of trades? And we can do things like provably find the outliers. So don't open up all your transactions, but provably open up all of your transactions that fall outside of a certain range. We can also do well-known financial risk measurements like the Herfindahl Index, which is uh, a measure for how concentrated uh, an economy is. So we have an implementation of this, which is not released yet, but will be soon. So the ZK Ledger system is written in Go. We use the BTEC EC library, um, elliptic curve SECP256K1, which is the same curve used in Bitcoin. It's a few thousand lines of code, um, and we implemented another of op optimizations to make this fast. An evaluation of our system shows that it's fairly reasonable. Transaction sizes are on the order of five kilobytes, which isn't great, but isn't too bad. 90% of that number is the range proof. And like I said, I, we think bulletproofs could greatly help here. To so we're optimistic that we can reduce the size of transactions. Auditing for an auditor that is online and is looking at the ledger as things are happening is very, very fast because auditors can pre-compute certain numbers that help them confirm answers very quickly. So for all online, if all participants are online, all the banks and the auditor, then auditing is very fast. It's on the order of milliseconds per bank. 
Creating transactions is also not so bad on the order of 20 milliseconds per bank. So that's 20 milliseconds per entry in the transaction. And remember, there's an entry for each bank. Verifying transactions is on the order of 10 milliseconds per bank. However, there is a certain n-squared component here. That n-squared component is that the more banks there are, the bigger the transactions are, and every bank has to validate every transaction. So that's where we're getting n squared for. However, this validation can be done in parallel. In our experiments, um, it benefits greatly from an increased number of cores. So the more cores you have, the faster that this goes. However, in our experiments, we're only able to scale to roughly tens of banks, and we'd like to consider how to scale this up to be bigger. Here's a graph that shows that online auditing is very fast. It doesn't really matter how large the ledger is. This is a ledger ranging from a very small number of transactions to 100,000 transactions, and you can see the line is pretty much straight. So if an auditor is online and is maintaining what we call commitment caches, then they can um, confirm the answers to auditing queries in real time. And if you check out our paper, there are many more graphs showing more components of the evaluation. I want to take a moment to talk about related work. Um, <clears throat> there are multiple different papers and systems that people have created that are kind of around this idea. Uh, the most closely related is a paper um, out of uh, MIT, actually, about priv privacy-preserving methods for sharing financial risk exposures. This paper uses multi-party computation between banks. However, because they don't have an underlying blockchain which represents the digital assets, they can't guarantee that the answers to the auditor are actually correct and complete. We can. So in that paper, um, banks could lie about what they actually have on their balance sheets. You might argue that there's less incentive for them to lie since they, are, they don't have to reveal individual transactions, but it could still happen. In our system, banks can't lie because the auditor is looking at a ledger that actually shows who owns what asset. Um, there's a paper called Provisions, which is about how um, exchanges can prove the assets that they're actually holding. And we actually use a lot of very similar, to technique, similar techniques to Provisions. Um, but again, provision suffers from the problem where exchanges can collude. There's also Solidus, which is a privacy-preserving blockchain which uses ORM um, in order to achieve privacy. Uh, it does not support auditing. Perhaps it could be extended to do so. And then there is also a paper which describes a design that might apply to Zcash to do certain types of auditing and accountable privacy. Um, so far, we haven't seen an implementation of this, and because it's using ZK Snarks, it requires trusted setup. So, in conclusion, I presented a piece of work that we've done at the Digital Currency Initiative called ZK Ledger. It provides practical privacy with participant verification and complete auditing. And this paper will appear in NSDI in April. We use well-understood crypto components to support useful audit inquiries. And we have a website that currently is a GitHub repo with the paper in it. <laughs> so we will be doing more work to put out information on this website. But if you'd like to read the paper, it is available at zkledger.org. And that's all. Um, thank you very much. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. So if there are any questions about this or about regulation in general, I'm happy to answer. Hi there. Is that on? Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, you said here that the banks can't lie, but couldn't they pull the Bernie Madoff and um, have a, uh, um, a duplicate copy of their transaction system and then feed that into the ledger. Um, it's almost as if one would need a, an audit of the completeness of the information systems and their transactions actually being mirrored in the ledger. 
Yeah, so um, I think where this really applies is when you're auditing the economy for a digital asset that only exists on the ledger. So just like Bitcoin only exists on the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, and the blockchain is the determination of who owns what Bitcoin, um, I think that this could be useful for things like over-the-counter markets. If we were to co convert a certain type of asset into a digital asset, then, um, and it only existed on that ledger, then that's where this would be useful. But you're right, if the assets exist outside the ledger, then the ledger is just tracking other information and those two things could be out of sync. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, so you said that banks cannot actually lie. Uh, of course, the banks can't lie about the information which is in the blockchain, you know, but what if they lie about the answers they're giving, what they have on the balance sheet? How would you prevent that uh, bank lying from there? So ZK Ledger does not help for things outside of the ZK Ledger system. Right. So this is just about the digital assets that are being tracked on ZK Ledger. If they lie about what's on the ledger, so the ledger is the determination of who owns what. Right. And if the bank tries to give an answer to the auditor that is inconsistent with the ledger, the auditor will detect it with extraordinarily high probability. But the idea of a blockchain is that the blockchain, everything, uh, it, you know, what, you don't have to audit what's there on the blockchain because transactions are, the, the <coughs> amounts are already, I'm, I know you're talking about a, a private blockchain out here, you know, but on a blockchain, there's no need for someone to lie on the blockchain because blockchain, the way the blockchain works is everyone, in a system kind of understands what everyone else is doing. Although in this case, it's private blockchain, it'll be in the restricted group. But my, that's not my question. You know, do you know how frauds happen? I, I was an auditor, I was a technology auditor with Ernst Young. Do you know how frauds happen in any system? Um, it does not, it does I'm sorry, not I don't quite understand your question, but yeah, maybe we so, can talk about it offline, yeah, yeah, because so, I think we're running out of time. Okay, so I yeah. just want to make a statement. Frauds do not happen because... Uh, I'm sorry, if you don't have a question, then I think you should step back, because okay. this is for questions. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just want to ask, uh, do you, have you thought of any other applications besides auditing? I think that would be really interesting. Um, sorry, say that again? Have you, um, at ZK Ledger, have you guys thought of any applications beyond just auditing banks? Are there um, any other applications? No, it's mostly around auditing. Um, but I think auditing is a word that's pretty broad. It's not just what um, you know, the big four do. It's about provably correct answers to queries <laughs> over the ledger. But I'm curious to hear more applications. I would love to hear if you have other ideas where we could apply this. Thank you. Um, I think we're probably done now. Thank you very much. How did that go? Is it okay? Okay, good. Okay. All right. So that's the conclusion of our opening talk. If you're looking for the talk on decentralized acyclic graphs, we're going to need to go over to 26100. And we're going to continue in here in 32123 with Michael Casey as the moderator of a talk on governance and regulation. And so Michael Casey is a professional writer, a professional speaker. Um, I'll let him introduce the rest of the uh, panelists. To be here? Yeah. Thanks, Have fun. Have fun. Am I on? No. Yes, I am. Good. Thanks, Jinda. Great. So, people coming in, do we need to wait a little bit or we just, just get going, I think, right? Um, hi, everybody. Uh, change of gears. We had the brilliant Nehan Narula, who I work with at the DCI, uh, give us some, some, some really exciting tech. Um, so we've gone from the nerds to, to the lawyers, in a way. Um, we're here to talk about the uh, exciting world of regulation. Um, and I've got with me, I would say, pretty much of an all-star panel, Gary Gensler, who um, amongst a history of, of Working in and out of Washington and Wall Street, uh, most recently uh, he was, uh, well, he had some other things, but the most, most prominently was the, the, the last chair of the CFTC in the Obama administration, right? Correct. CFTC, the, the, Committees, uh, the Commodities Futures Trade Commission. Yeah, I was chair of that, but after that, my last thing was uh, Hillary's chief financial officer. Hillary's chief financial, officer. exactly, so yeah. Deeply but... into losing a campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jerry Brito, many of you would know, uh, the director of, the, of Coin Center, uh, which is an advocacy group based in Washington. 
And Patrick Merck, who um, has been there from the, pretty much the beginning of it all, uh, Bitcoin Foundation for some time as general counselor and briefly as executive director, now at the, the Berkman Center at Harvard uh, and also a, a lawyer at Cooley. So um, some big names. I just want to just frame this and to, and, and to say why I'm excited to be here. Uh, I am based at MIT, so it's just nice to be on, on home turf. I've just been on a bit of a whistle stop book tour and uh, I've just published a book and, and it, during that period you kind of get fated as this, you know, as the star. People come up and congratulate you all the time and you, you get your ego stroked all the time. And um, so I was thinking about this panel because as much as we have a nice big crowd here, I understand this is the overflow room. So this is the second fiddle to, to everyone else. Um, and I've got, as I said, an all-star panel. So I should perhaps be a little offended, right? My, my ego should be a little bit upset by this when the cryptographers in the other room are talking about, you know, directed acyclic graphs and these sort of complicated things. When in reality, that's what makes this a wonderful event. That this is a place where you're not going to get necessarily the egos strutting up and down talking about you know, who they know in Washington and who they don't, but that we're really focusing on what's being built here. So I want to make sure that we, this conversation is framed around that very important work, that the stuff that's happening at this institution and others to, to build out this exciting new technology in the best way possible is enabled uh, in the safest, best way possible by the regulation. So let's just put that in context. Anyway, it's, I'm just thrilled to be here and to, to, to see you all come along. So I, I would like each of you to just give us a bit of a framing of, of where things stand. Um, I'm actually going to go to Jerry first because, um, you know, you've been in this advocacy role for about four years now. Is it longer? Four? Five? Four point center more before that. Right, exactly. But coin centers four years. So you've really seen, you know, you've been at the front lines dealing with regulators. Are they getting it? What's happened? Um, are we moving forwards, backwards? You know, in terms of how regulators understand and are responding to this technology, how have we evolved? So <clears throat> I think if you start with the premise that um, we have any number of laws and regulations that uh, implicate this technology and uses of this technology, and those laws will be applied. Um, if, you, if you sort of start there, um, you then what you want to hope for is that the folks who are in charge of interpreting the law and then applying it will understand the technology, so they don't make mistakes. They don't, you know, they don't do anything out of ignorance. Um, and then that where they have calls to make, that they make calls that err on the side of innovation, right? Of allowing um, innovators to do what they do. And with that metric in mind, I think it's been a very positive four years. Um, because just, just from the very beginning, um, I mean, there's some glaring uh, uh, um, sort of um, uh, examples of the opposite, right? So you have the bid license, for example, where it was just a, a disaster, the way that that was uh, approached. Um, but in general, it's very positive if you think about you know, the way that the anti-money laundering laws have been interpreted and you know, initially, um, you could quibble with the process, but the result um, sort of was fair. And since they were first announced, it's been further um, refined. Um, if you think about the tax treatment, it's not the worst thing that could have happened. Um, so using that bar, I think it's been incredibly positive. I think, I think folks in DC, um, the fo as this technology begins to implicate their jurisdiction, right, so whether it's Anti-money laundering was first, tax was second, right? Um, then it was the CFPB, now it's the SEC. So as it implicates them, typically they really get up to speed quickly um, and, uh, and, and learn a lot. I think um, lately the ship has been shaking uh, a bit just because the velocity um, of, uh, uh, of, of what's happening in this space is just exploding and um, there's much more demand for information about this. And so lately, uh, I think we're start starting to see a lot of folks, especially in Congress, jump in who maybe have not taken the time to educate themselves. And so, and so I think we, we need to sort of address that. So lately, I, 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 you know, I, I detect um, uh, maybe some slowing down of that positivity, but in general, it's been positive. 
That's an interesting perspective. That once we sort of widen the awareness, you sort of have to once again start re-educating people, or no, newly educating those who weren't before because they're starting to participate. So Patrick, you know, you've also been on this journey for some time, um, and you know, you, you've dealt with it both from something of an advocacy role, you know, you've always been there as a, as a sounding board for regulators, but you've also been in the private practice world of, of, of law. Um, you know, how is that, how is that, that evolved uh, in terms of, you know, the way that lawyers themselves have come to it um, and, and, and what role can the profession play in, in trying to sort of move this into a safe space? Yeah, that's right. And thanks, Mike. And um, I know that we're not supposed to stroke 